it's the person who has, for example, a drug problem or a smoking problem or an alcohol problem. And they, they say that they want to give up, but they don't really. When they come to that aha moment, I'm ready to give up. I really want to do this. That's when their transformation starts. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We explore how you can innovate through creativity, compassion, and collaboration. I believe that innovation combined with compassion and creative thinking can save the world, and I aim to bring you ways you can do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you can support it by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a cuppa at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm super thrilled you're here. I'm also really, really happy to introduce you to this week's guest. Dagmar Bryant, PhD, is a UK-based Australian motivational speaker and mindset and transformational coach. Already, she's my people. Utilizing her knowledge, belief, and wisdom, she's inspired people all around the world to make constructive changes and dramatically transform their lives. Dagmar has graced speaking platforms globally, including the USA, UK, and Australia, helping many people across all avenues of life. She's appeared on TV and been heard on radio. She has been published in Wellness Press and has produced two meditation CDs. So as I said, she is my people. I'm so excited to meet you, Dagmar. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Isolde. It's absolutely exciting to be here. This is so, um, this is wonderful on so many levels. We were just chatting about the fact that we have some things in common from when we were kids. We both moved to different countries when we were little and had to sort of get used to a new culture and a new way of doing things. When you work with people, how much does your own sort of transformation and the the growth that you had to have play into the way you see the people that you work with transform their lives? What a fabulous question. It has a huge impact. When you go into the personal development field, you find that your own issues need to be dealt with first. So there are going to be things that come up in your own life that you've either had experience with or that you've had you have familiar familiarity with in some way and then somehow on a kind of woo woo universal kind of way people feel that from you and they are drawn to you they understand that there is something that they can help you with so for me i definitely had a huge transformation moving from germany to australia when i was six almost seven years old even through the course of my life as i've grown up being a teen teenager being bullied but they didn't call it being bullied back then it was like kind of just schoolyard stuff if you know right. what I mean sure. and it's just come really into the fore much later but even my own transformation from my background because I started in customer service and admin and law and having certain experiences and then changing out of law to have my own business that was a huge step. So people recognize that I've made these huge jumps and it's almost like she can help me because this is where I'm at. I need help with this. I recognize that she's done it. So if she's done it, she knows something that she can help me with to make that leap as well. That's so fascinating, that idea of because you've done it, that must mean that you can help me. It's a leap of faith, I think, but also it's interesting how much we relate our own lives through seeing how someone else has learned their lessons. And so when, when, you, when you transform, when you transform other people's lives or when you help them transform their own lives, what kind of lessons are they usually trying to learn? Like, what is the mindset of someone who comes to you and says, Dagmar, I need your help? What are they looking for generally? 
a lot of the times I, I, I have worked a lot of the times with women. It kind of wasn't how I set out to start my business, but a lot of the times it has been women, probably over 90% of my clients over the years have been women. And they usually come to me because they're stuck. They're at this point in their lives where they may have had one, possibly two kids. They may not be happy in their relationship. They're frustrated because they've tried many different things to achieve their goals. And it may just even come to that point where they go, I don't even know what I'm doing wrong, or I don't even know exactly what it is that I want anymore because they're feeling trapped in the life that they have. Mm -hmm. So they kind of need someone to help them navigate out of this, this stuck. And part of my job is to help them understand who they are and where is it that you really want to go? I'm taking, sorry, I'm pausing for a second because I'm taking it in. That that moment of recognition, I guess, or of awareness about where you are is such a tender place. When, you, when you're in that space with a client, when they come to that realization, this is going to sound like a strange question, but how much does your awareness count as far as being able to guide someone else? Like, what is your state of mind when you're working with someone in order to help them at that moment of realization? My job as their coach is almost like a guide. Mm -hmm. So I want to help them get the answers to the questions that they're looking for. So my part in that journey is to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. well, what have you done? What have you tried so far? What area of your life are you really dissatisfied with? And the funny thing is that invariably we may start out with, oh, I'm unhappy with my job. But then, and this is where the real transformation takes place, once you dig down deeper, you realize they come to you with one thing, but it's many other things that are really at the root cause of that. And two or three, maybe even four or five sessions when they've developed more of that trust and the, that maybe that initial query has been answered, then we get to the true nitty gritty and the real problem might be their relationship, either with their partner or their mother or their father hmm. or something else that's in the background. And we need to do, do a lot of digging to find out the true cause of what's making them so stuck. Again, I'm taking it off. <laughs> I, feel, <laughs> but I, feel, I feel a little bit like, like uh, uh, whoa, and I want to I wanna take it all in so I can ask uh, a question that, that makes sense to you as well as inside my own head. So if they are in that space and they find out, they figure out or, or discover or uncover the sort of the core issue, this is a strange question, but it sounds like it's almost psychology. And what is the difference between the coaching that you do and a psych what something that a therapist or a psychologist would do? Well, I guess if I was a if I was a psychologist, I'd be able to define that a little bit better for <laughs> you. But I'm not a psychologist, and a lot of I am a qualified health counselor. Mm -hmm. So I have also worked as a hypnotherapist, and I've worked with past life regression. Mm -hmm. I have a deeper understanding of that. There's more to a problem than just what's coming up right now. Invariably, there will be patterns that we uncover. And when we're working with a client, and I hope I'm answering your question here, we need to really understand that there's more layers that need to be uncovered. So me as a coach, I don't try to be a psychologist. I come from it 
because with uh, coaching, you do actually do a lot of NLP and that's where the hypnotherapy comes in as well. So you come at it from a slightly different perspective. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the first things I ever learned when I studied hypnotherapy was that psychologists basically say to you, yep, there you go. We'll book you in for 10 sessions away. You go, you'll be cured sort of thing. And I thought that was a very strange take on it because we're human beings. Ten sessions doesn't mean that you're automatically fixed. We we have so many layers within us and so many experiences that we need to look at to work out, well, what really is going on? And a lot of the times things can get worked through rather quickly, mm -hmm. but there's no sort of one size fits all. And I think psychologists probably do that, whereas a coach will... In a lot of times, and I know I do this, intuitively work with a client in terms of what they say. And it's like our conversation. It is a conversation that you're having with your client to see where it leads, to see what unfolds, rather than having a script that you're using with them. And that's that's like the be all and end all. And I don't work like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It it does. And it's interesting because I, I, I'm a coach as well. And when I work with my clients that what you just said about being intuitive, I think is so important. When you are in that space of being of, of, of accessing your intuition, how do I mean, first of all, you have to trust it, right? You have to trust your own intuition about what you're hearing about what the conversation is. But mm -hmm. how do you how do you utilize your intuition in order to be able to help a client transform? Like what is that process internally for you as a coach? I guess I like to call it an inkling there's something that just pops into your head. And as you say, you have to trust what's kind of being given to you, whether we call that from our guides, whether we call that from our higher self, however you define your own intu intuition, how it works. Mm -hmm. But you get an inkling, and I like that word, because it's like an intuitive hit. And something is telling you that there is more to be uncovered about a particular Thing that is being discussed mm -hmm. and you kind of just delve into that and you go oh you mentioned such and such did I get that correct and they'll go yes or no and then you'll go well tell me more and then you just kind of it's it's almost like a maze you kind of need to uncover where those puzzle pieces take you hmm it's so interesting when when I work with my own clients we do a lot of we do a lot of work around their intuition and developing them hone their skills to be able to sort of see when something feels right and when it doesn't. When you're working with your clients, when you're helping them sort of develop their plans of action, if you will, how much does their their intuition come into play? Like what what do you do as far as building their skills to be able to do that for themselves eventually? Oh, look, absolutely. I think the first important thing to recognize here is that there's a part of themselves, whether we call it their intuition or their own sense of self, that has guided them to you in the first place. Mm. And they, there's a part of them internally that knows they they need some answers and they're looking for a way out. So you've already got two points of validation that they're using their intuition. And I like to call it your gut. Your gut <laughs> is telling you. And, and guys, when you're working with guys, guys are hilarious for this because they don't call it intuition because no, 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 that is just way too feminine. When you call it your <laughs> gut, yeah, yeah. When you call it your gut, that has some meat on the bones, you see. And guys understand that. And I remember being at an expo and I was promoting my business and this couple came up to me and I was explaining exactly this process. And the lady was asking the questions, but the guy was standing next to her. And I said, yeah, take cops, for example. They, they don't always understand the why of what's going on, but they call it, yeah, I'll go with my gut or I don't know what it is, but there's something hinky about that guy. And the lady turned to me and she said, 
you do know that my husband is a cop, don't you? And it was the <laughs> funniest moment because that's kind of how it works. Even for guys, whether it's a guy or a girl, there's something and it's that indefinable something. And I encourage my clients to use their gut because your gut, your intuition, call it whatever term you like, Mm -hmm. it is strong. And if we trust it, it won't actually fail us. And one of the things I do ask my clients is, Think about it this way, going back in your life, remember a few incidences where you have trusted that inner guidance. Did it fail you? And the answer invariably comes back as, well, no, it was absolutely the right thing. And then the next question becomes, well, did you ever not trust it or did you ever not follow it? And what happened? And the answer invariably comes back as, oh, that just turned into a disaster. Ah. (laughs) So again, you've got that validation. They know that there's something there, whatever they want to call it. I usually allow people to call it whatever they feel comfortable with because the terminology makes it then easier for them to grasp. And if Mm -hmm. they can do that, then you're, you're talking to them on their level the terminology doesn't matter because you're talking about the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? So, <laughs> so, so uh, this is this is the Innovative Mindset podcast. So I have to ask about this. As as a coach, what do you? How are you an innovator in the field? Like, what do you do that's different than than another coach who is working in a similar way to transform their clients? But I I find that everybody, every coach I've ever talked to has their own, you know, like you said early on in this chat, we all have unique experiences growing up and they shape how we do pretty much everything. So, so how are you different than other coaches? What, what have you, how are you innovating? Long question, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'll do my best to be mindful of how how long I take to answer that. I guess it's my take on life. I guess it's also the way I approach things. Forgive me, not everybody likes my very direct approach and maybe that's the Aussie in me maybe that's the German that I was taught from my father. you know call a spade a spade if you, If you want to take action and if you want to be decisive and if you want to move forward, come with me. If you want to have someone who will hold your hand, who will molly coddle you, who will go there, 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 I'm probably not the person for you. Mm. I think a lot's got to do with style as well. If If you like the way that you're resonating with someone, at the core of it, a lot of us coaches have been taught similar kind of things it's like going to school you've all been taught math geography history whatever and the knowledge is probably very similar what makes me different from you or anybody else is my background my experience how I interpret what I want to impart to my client and how I think it's going to help them move forward that was fairly succinct, wasn't it? Oh, it wasn't. No, no, no. It wasn't you. It were. It, I wasn't. I was saying that it was my question that was long. It took me a while to to get to the actual point of my question. You're great. I was just like, hmm. As I'm forming how I'm going to say this, I take 15 minutes to do it. So, so, hmm. This brings me to a to a kind of a an interesting point because. I totally get what you're saying about about being direct and about not molly coddling clients. I think that <laughs> I love that. And and yet there's there is that that vulnerability that clients have when they seek a coach out to begin with and and there are some tender places that that you explore as you work with them. So how do you handle those vulnerable and tender spots in in what in an inevitable way i mean every client's going to have those places in inside themselves 
Absolutely. And I think that's where understanding comes in. You can be compassionate and understanding. You can be empathetic. I'm not I'm not a total hard ass where I don't see <laughs> that side of somebody. So of course I can understand if someone's gone through grief and loss and I can, you know, definitely work with all of that because I'm sure as you would appreciate as well, we've all had loss in our lives, whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's the loss of a relationship, it can be a physical loss, whatever that happens to be. So there will always need to be compassion and understanding. But at the core of it, if you're going to give me BS, then I'm sorry, I'm not in, you know, if you're going to tell me your grandmother died three times, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work for me. <laughs> It's like a, it's like, you know, school notes. Oh, my, my grandmother died. And then the other grandmother died. And then the third grandma and then the 12th. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, and my dog ate, my dog ate my homework. Now, come on, really, you're a grown up now, you can deal with this. <laughs> oh, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And yet, you know, it's funny. And this is something that I don't know if this happens to you, but I've had clients who have gotten into this place where they they were trying to please me rather than work through themselves. It's almost like they had this thought that I expected them to do X, Y, and Z. And so that's why they were doing it rather than because it was for their own self-improvement and, and growth. How, how, much, how much do you think we do that? How much do you think we as people uh, sort of do what we do because of others' expectations on us? What do you think that's about and, and how often do you think that happens? I would say that is absolutely huge. I would say that it happens a lot. And I've been guilty of it myself because for for me, I pretty much, um, it was my father and I pretty, I wouldn't say I idolised him, but my, fa my father had a special spot for me in terms of who he was mm. and the way he his outlook was on life he had a big influence on my life and when I was making decisions to move forward when I was in my teens in terms of my own career I did listen to him not always that wasn't always the best thing to do but mm. I did want in some way to please him so mm. when I wanted to be a flight attendant and my father said Oh, no, 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 that is no good. You know that they're only glorified waitresses. And I'm going, oh, crap. Like for me, being a flight attendant was my dream because here I could go travel the world. I could do whatever I wanted to do in terms of seeing places while still, you know, working for an organization. But my, my father drummed it down to something so simplified. And I thought, well, at the time, you know what it's like when you're a teenager, you have, it has such an impact on you. And for a lot of clients, I've seen that too. You know, if, if the father or the mother is an influential person in the community or they have their own business, well, then there's almost an expectation and it's often the son, but also the daughter who gets pushed into following a similar career to follow the path in that business. Daddy is a lawyer. So we want you to be a lawyer and we want you to keep on with the family, family um, occupation. So I think there is a lot of that that goes on. Hmm. And how do we break free of that? What are your thoughts on that? I guess step one is recognizing it. Where does it come from? Hmm. That's always a big aha moment when we realize Ah, that's where that came from. That's kind of the first step of breaking a cycle. It's the person who has, for example, a drug problem or a smoking problem or an alcohol problem, and they, they say that they want to give up, but they don't really. When they come to that aha moment, I'm ready to give up. I really want to do this. That's when their transformation starts. And it's an ongoing thing, isn't it? It's something that once you start, you can't unsee it. You can't unknow it. Yes, that's right. And and having worked with clients in hypnosis, you do realize that often there are patterns in, 
you know, when you say pleasing someone, it's the person who comes to me, usually a lady, because like I said, that's the majority of my clientele who comes to me because she's having a problem in her current relationship. And then when we dig deeper, she's had many relationships that have the same kind of pattern that goes on in that relationship, whether it's abuse on a physical or on an emotional level, when you're talking about someone who totally disempowers her, various other things, but often there is a pattern there. And the first step in breaking that is recognizing that so that then you can let go of those ties. Mm. It's interesting, the, the recognition of the pattern I think, I, yes, I absolutely agree. It's crucial. And then that next step of going, okay, now I have to build build the time between recognizing the pattern and what I do about it. And when you're talking about that, when you're talking about changing our behavior, you know, now that you, now that you have this awareness of that this is your pattern, the next thing is to, 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 be, to begin to change the behavior. How do your clients do that? How do they, how do they, what do you do to help them increase their chances of breaking some of those patterns? I think we have to go back a step almost before that is older because sometimes clients even recognize that they don't want to do anything about it. And that in itself can be really, really empowering. Mm. And I, I can think of the example of New Year's resolutions and how many times have you heard someone say, oh, I'm going to give up smoking. Oh, I'm going to lose 10 pounds or 10 kilos, whatever it happens to be. And they move along into the year and it's January and it's February and lo and behold, they're still smoking. They're still following the same routine with, with their food. And then you have to ask the question, well, do you even actually want to do anything about it? you can't help someone who doesn't want to do anything about it. So again, the first recognition is even asking that question. Well, are you committed? Do you really want to do something about it? And then if the answer is yes, then that's where you can put goals and action steps into place to help them move out of that pattern. And sometimes it can be baby steps. It might not even be everything at once because you want to give them the confidence. Ah, I'm doing something. This is fantastic. This feels great. Well, let's keep going. Let's try something else. And do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it makes, I mean, I love that you said that it's okay if the answer is no, I don't want to change it. Mm. it it's so fascinating to me because we do need that sort of we need to give ourselves permission to stay where we are if that's what we really want. But then yeah. you can't complain about it, you know? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, that's true. Absolutely. I mean, some people will complain about anything and everything, but we have to recognize our objections. And it comes down to, well, okay, you can tell me that you want to, but then you tell me, oh, but I can't because I have, don't have time or I don't have this or I don't have that. I don't have the money or it's not the right time for me or my grandmother's sick or, or something. And you've got to break through those objections and say, well, okay, you're bringing up a lot of stuff here. Is this actually real? How often are people willing to be honest with themselves about that? That's a very good question. Usually by the time they come to see a coach, they do want to work on whatever the issue is because they've already identified, I need some help. I can't keep going the way I'm going because I'm like that, that mouse going around the wheel, doing the same thing over and over again. It's probably the people who don't have a coach, who don't have a mentor, who trying to, who are trying to do it on their own and keep battling away, who are stuck in that uh, wheel and keep giving themselves the same excuses over and over again about even why they don't want to have a coach or why a coach won't work or why they don't have the money for a coach. Hmm. Interesting. I, this, this is so, this is going to be a strange question because of what you just said about sort of breaking through some of the barriers, knowing that you need help, jumping, jumping way forward into the future. 
what does it look like when someone is set when they when they don't need a coach anymore when they don't when they're like ready to graduate from working with Dagmar Bryant I'm ready to move on what does that look like and is it you who recognizes that or do you leave that up to the client to recognize that I think it's a discussion that you have together in terms of well how do you feel about it I certainly don't want to push anyone into making a commitment for another six months when they certainly don't need it. Mm -hmm. So it's about seeing where they are at a particular point in time. Have they reached the goal that they set for themselves? And if they want to go in a new direction, that's okay. By all means, sign up with, with me again. But it's really ascertaining, well, where are you? And is it where you wanted to be when you started with me? And you can determine that. It's that's a discussion that you'll have between the two of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that makes all, that makes so much sense. And and I love, I love that what you're working on is helping someone feel empowered. And and I guess the next question for me is, objectively speaking, what does that mean to you? What does what is an empowered person? What are their characteristics? It would be someone who feels really good about where they are at in life and overall they're feeling content, happy, they're feeling motivated and inspired to keep going, to still work towards other goals even without me. It's someone who feels that they can do it. Where there was no hope before, there is hope now. Interesting. I keep saying that because I'm so fascinated by what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a monkey wrench into the works, and I'm gonna ask you about Buddhism. Not that you necessarily are a are a Buddhist or know anything about Buddhism, but I wanna I wanna. There, lots of people practice Buddhism, and there is a definition. I don't know if you know who Pema Chodron is. She's a Buddhist nun, writes a lot of self-improvement, sort of self-actualization books. She's pretty, pretty well known. And she wrote the one definition, the one Buddhist definition of the word hopelessness that I can get behind. And that is hopelessness is the release of all hope for an alternative to the present moment. And the reason I want to talk to you about that is because you said where there was no hope before, there is hope now. Mm -hmm. And so, so what looking at that definition of hopelessness like sort of not trying to have something that is that is alternate to where you are and being and feeling the frustration of that but instead allowing yourself to be peaceful with where you are how does that correlate to your notion of hope versus no hope well buddhism or not aside i would say Everybody needs hope in some way. Mm -hmm. The most, well, uh, relevant example that I can think of is the pandemic that is all over the world at the moment. People need hope that they're going to get through it, hope that they're going to have enough finances to be able to provide for their family, hope that things are going to improve. It's that light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when people are feeling so stuck, they almost feel as if there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And that's where I say it's that hope, hope that they can actually see that there is that light, that they are able to, you know, feel good about where they're at and where their life is progressing to, that their life has meaning, that their life has purpose. Where there once was no hope, there is now hope. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I wonder what you just said about where their life has purpose. How often do people discover their purpose through working with you versus perhaps not knowing what it was before? Because the purposeful life to me is very important. I love that I, that notion. And so 
when you're working with someone to empower them to tr transform their lives, how much does their purpose, whatever it might be, because they might not know what it is when they come to you, how much does their purpose play into the work that you do together? It depends on where they themselves are at. Some people are very, very clear on what they think their purpose is. They just haven't gotten to fulfill it or they've got to a place where they just don't see it make being able to be in a position where they can fulfill that purpose. So it really depends on where they're, they're at. If they know or if they have an inkling, as we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. they it's easier to to move them forward in that direction. But even then, sometimes it's about working out, well, is this what is really meaningful to you as well? Because like the example with the New Year's resolutions, it's about meaning. And sometimes we think we want something when we don't. And again, it's trusting that inner guidance of, well, where are we supposed to be? And for the people who really don't know, we definitely do some work on values and looking at the intricacies of what they believe about themselves and what they are meant to be doing. Because even though sometimes people say, I just don't know what my purpose is, when we do some digging, and often it takes time to go back to you know your earlier years it's like the little boy who always wanted to be a fireman it's like the little girl who always wanted to be a ballerina while those are sort of dreams you do form an idea of what you want and sometimes we have to go back to what those idealized dreams were to go forward if that makes sense oh absolutely i do similar work with my own clients that notion of of figuring that out for yourself you know and and sort of tracing that six-year-old's dream to what the 36 year old or 46 year old might be might be wanting is really not only is it fascinating but i think it's important and so so let's say someone wanted to be a firefighter when they were six and now they're 38 and they want to figure out how that can play into what they're doing with their lives now. I mean, now they might be an accountant, for example, and yet the dream was to be a firefighter. So how do you do that when, when someone whose purpose or dream is so different than where they are today, how do you help them transform that? How do you help them move through some of what are mental barriers, but some are probably physical or financial barriers. What are the ways that you help them transform in that way? You've kind of partially answered that question already because it is about working through those barriers. So have they got, for example, a, a house and a family and a mortgage and 2.3 kids and credit card bills? So they might not be able to leave their job right now. But what we can do is ascertain, well, how important is that dream still you? Is it, sorry, is that dream still to you? So is it something that is actually a dream or do you really want to make it a goal? Is it something that you want to make a reality as part of your life? And then it's almost like a business plan. You kind of have to put a plan into place. Mm. Well, what do you want to do about mm. making that happen? And again, we have to go back to saying, well, it's actually okay if, if, if we keep it as a dream. And, you know, if you want to play as a volunteer firefighter, I say play because that's the six-year-old. So mm -hmm. if you want to be, if you want to be a firefighter, you might choose to be a volunteer rather than making it your full-time occupation you can still get around making that happen it's a way of blending what you perceive to be your needs with what you, what your wants are i love that i think that's great <laughs> i do i think that's so great because because i think so many of us find ourselves in positions where we don't know you know we just don't know what the next step should be and it's you're standing there and you're going there are any number of directions i could go but because there are so many directions 
I'm confused and I don't go anywhere. And I, I feel like a coach helps you figure out what some of the better directions might be and also helps you figure out which direction you might want to start walking in. And sometimes you don't realize the direction is the wrong direction until you've gone a few steps in that direction. So when someone does that, when someone goes, no, 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 this is really what I want. And you go, okay, what happens when they come back and go, yeah, that was not the right direction. How, how do you handle that with someone who does that? The first thing to recognize there, Isolde, is I believe that there are no mistakes. Mm. You've made a valuable step by taking a step. And even if it didn't end up taking you to exactly where you wanted to go, you still have gained valuable knowledge. Sometimes it's important to do something to realize that it's not what we want. Let mm -hmm. me give you an example. I, st I always wanted, after I decided I wasn't going to be a flight attendant, I decided I wanted to study law. And that was something I was really, really passionate about. I have this crazy in uh, deep, deep value around justice. Mm -hmm. And so I, because of the decisions that I made when I was in high school, partly because I was trying to please my father because they wanted me to do math and I wasn't as good as math as they thought I was, it it meant that I couldn't study law going straight out of high school because I didn't have enough credits to go to college or university, whatever you want to call it. So I studied law quite late. And the good thing was, I, well, I should say, I discovered that law wasn't actually for me because of certain experiences. I was working for patent and trademark attorneys. I was still studying part-time and I was probably more of an idealist lawyer rather than realizing, well, realizing that I could only help so many people. And mm. with my experiences, I just realized this is just not the kind of justice that I thought I would be helping others with. And that kind of put paid to my experience in law because I quit law school and I quit the, the, the law firm where I was working at. That doesn't mean that I made a mistake in studying law. I learned so much. I realized my passion and I'm still very passionate about law, but I also realized that it wasn't what my purpose was. I couldn't, I couldn't help people the way I help people now because I guess I was too idealistic, whereas mm. now it's much more of a hands-on helping people at the core. So my journey down law was never a mistake because it taught me so much. So when someone comes back to me and say, oh, yeah, I went down that path and, gee, well, um, that didn't work out so well, that's actually okay. Look at what you have learned. And you're not going to have any regrets going forward thinking, oh, I should have done that because you did it and you realized that, hey, I don't want it. <laughs> so it's win-win. <laughs> it's win-win. I love it. I love it. That's great. I, I, that's a wonderful way of looking at it. And I'm sure your clients really appreciate that. Dagmar, I am so grateful that you've taken the time to chat with me here on the show. This has been such a delightful conversation and I would love to find out from you where someone who might want to know more about you and your work could find you what what are you i'm going to put all of that stuff in the social media the i mean in the show notes but i would love it if you would uh, just tell sort of say where someone might go to find you on say instagram or facebook or any one of the other very many social media platforms <laughs> well first of all i have a website so dagmarbryant.com is great for answering lots of questions about what I do and you can connect straight in in and book and book a 30 minute discovery session with me I'm primarily on Facebook and on LinkedIn and just type in Dagmar Bryant there's not many of us around so you should find <laughs> me relatively easily I also have a group that I created for fabulous 40s 50s and beyond so if you want to join me in the group we have some wonderful discussions in there as well I love it is that a Facebook group yes it is a Facebook group Oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to have to join because I'm in my fabulous 50s. So, 
<laughs> so yeah, thank you so much, Dagmar, for for joining me on the show. And I I have just one because I could keep you all day, but I know <laughs> that you have a life to get back to. So I I'm wondering if I can ask you. I ask this question of everybody who comes on the show, and it's a strange little question, but I find that it gives some really poignant answers. And the question is this: If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Life is not about sitting on the sidelines. It's a, to sorry to um, it's about taking calculated risk. To achieve results, you need to take calculated risks. I love that. And I actually, could you do me a favor? Because I know I said I'd let you go and you have a life to get back to, but I would love it if you'd define what a calculated risk is. Calculated to me means that you've thought about it, that you haven't done anything outlandish and absolutely crazy like jumping off a bridge without thinking of the consequences. <laughs> so calculated to me means even though I went bungee jumping when I was 23, 24 years old, I assessed that, hey, it's pretty safe and it's a suspension bridge and, you know, if worse comes to worse, there'll be people around who re can rescue me. It's not like going out into the wilderness like Bear Grylls or one, one of those guys and having nobody around you. So that's what I mean by calculated <laughs> risk. I love it. I love it. That's actually on my my bucket list is to bungee jump. I can't wait to do it. I've, done, I've gone skydiving, but I have never bungee jumped and that's something I really want to do. Right. Well, I haven't skydived yet. My daughter skydived and told me it was absolutely amazing. I haven't quite had the courage to do that, though. You know what's amazing about it is that first first time you jump, you're sort of tethered to somebody behind you who knows how to do it all. So you basically just sit along for the ride. You don't have to do anything except for enjoy the ride. And for a control freak like me, that freedom of zero control because you're just in free fall was the most most it was gave it, it's very clarifying when you're in that in that oh there goes the plane and i'm falling at many many feet per second <laughs> it, it, and you know you watch the airplane because you fall out and you're kind of upside down you're looking at the sky and you can Ow. see the plane flying past you away from you and you're like wait come back and then you realize <laughs> no you're <laughs> You're flying and falling very quickly, but it was amazing, and I highly recommend it. Go with an experienced jumper. You'll be you'll be tethered to someone else. You will love if you like bungee jumping. You will absolutely love skydiving. Something to keep in mind, most <laughs> certainly. Dagmar, again, thank you so much for joining me on the Innovative Mindset. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me, and I hope your listeners have got something valuable from it. Oh, I'm yes, I, I know I got valuable things from it, so I'm sure if you're listening, you absolutely should get in touch with Dagmar Bryant, find out more about what she's doing. And if you're especially someone in your fabulous 40s or 50s, I think you need to go find that Facebook group and join it. That sounds like a lot of fun. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm super thrilled that you've been here, that you've joined in on this wonderful, poignant, incredible conversation. If you're liking what you're hearing, please remember I do have a way of supporting the show. You can go to patreon.com slash innovative mindset podcast and you can actually, no, wait a minute, I'm lying. It's slash innovative mindset. It's not innovative mindset podcast, so I should probably go get one for that too. Until next time, this is again is Olda Trachtenberg reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.